So you're telling me you're pretty much open to anything. You love trying new things. So here we are on a podcast. How does it feel? <laughs> you know, I, I, I like doing this. It, thankfully, I, I have one or two marketable skills in my life. Not a lot, but talking and writing. So as long as I'm in those realms, you know, I can't cook anything. I can't fix anything. I can't, I don't seem to be able to invent anything. But, uh, but uh, talking and writing, as long as I'm in that realm, I'm, I'm usually pretty comfortable. Yeah, this is pretty comparable to being like on, you know, CNBC or MSNBC or one of those, right? Fox. Well, it's yeah, pretty. I've done I've done a lot of this. One difference is, is that mostly when I'm on those shows, I'm paired with skinny, angry, blonde women in mini skirts, <laughs> who who look at me and see their ex husbands. So I I don't think you and I have reached that point yet together, but we're but we're just getting started. So what do you think is possible? Yeah, you do have that face. You got that you got that ex ex husband <laughs> face going. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, but but I didn't leave you for a 22 year old. I don't know why you're mad at me. Um, oh man. But anyway, no, that is, um, that is part of my life. Yeah. Do you, do you like, do you like being, being like that, the, the bully, I guess, or, or the villain? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I do it in, in a variety of networks. I spent 13 years on Fox where I was pretty much the visiting team, right? The, uh, yeah. and I'm, I'm a little more liberal than the, probably the average Fox host or, or, or Fox viewer. Um, it was an, it was an interesting performance challenge to be to be perfectly frank about it. It's easy to appear in front of an audience where everybody is inclined to like you. When it's like and here's mm-hmm. Elvis, and then they applaud. I mean, that's that's easy. It's it's harder to to stand in front of an audience that is not inclined to like you or not inclined to agree with you. And, and so it it demands more things of you mm-hmm. as a public person. So so. If I'm going to get people to even listen to what I'm saying in a place like that, I've got to, you know, be interesting, be charming, be funny, be surprising, be something other than than just going on and, and yelling. You know, if I'm sitting there with Sean Hannity mm-hmm. and he and I are screaming at each other, um, which is something I try to avo- try to avoid, uh, the audience is going to think he's strong and think I'm a jerk. And, you know, no, if we were doing it on MSNBC and it was the same two of us, the audience would have exactly the opposite reaction yeah. because they're, they're, they're predisposed in a different direction. But, but I've actually come to enjoy the challenge of trying to, uh, you know, do my best in front of a tough audience. It, it's actually kind of fun when you get into it. Like, uh, here's Ellis again, ready to, <laughs> ready to bash in our parade. Well, it's like, it's, it's like, and here's Ellis to lie to us. And then after that, it's up to me to handle it. Like, like in, in all my years at Fox, nobody ever told me what to say. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the bosses never said, go easy on this person. Or uh, I had complete freedom. Now, you know, it is true that the, the topic might be shaded in one direction or another. Yeah. And it might be seven of those skinny, angry, blonde women all yelling at me. So, you know, I mean, it was a, sometimes a tough, uh, a tough arena. but. But I like it. I mean, I'm from a big, loud family, so I, yeah. I guess I'm used to that sort of thing. So uh, for everybody listening, if you're uh, listening on one of the podcast platforms and you want to put a face to the name, be sure to check out Ellis Hennekin today, uh, his website, hennekin.com. That's H-E-N-I-C-A-N.com. It's an awesome website. From there, you could see his uh, YouTube videos, go on his Facebook uh, you pretty much, you name it, right? All, all the connections, all the different books. How many is it now? Like over 15? It um, feels like. Yeah, I guess something like that. 15 or 16. But but you're right. You got to be in all those places today, right? I mean, I you do. You know, I, I, I was like, you know, a lot of print guys, right? I mean, I started in the newspaper business and I was resistant to all of it. What do I need all that stuff for? I, I don't want to. But, but, you know, that's what people are. And so, yeah, I need it. I mean, I need Twitter and I need Facebook and I need Instagram and I need a website. And I mean, that's how you, that's how you communicate with people. How do you feel about that movement? Has it made your job, your life easier, harder? Both. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's great to have a lot of ways to connect with people. And each one, of course, is different, right? What you can do in a, in a short tweet is different from what you can do in a 300-page book, obviously. Um, but they all connect in a, in a different way. I've enjoyed it. I mean, there's some aspects of it that are challenging. I mean, I know you must find this in your life. You know, you're available 24 hours a day. Yeah. It used to be that when I filed my newspaper column, I could go home and go to the bar or, you know, whatever we were, whatever we were doing at the time. And I was done at, at this point. 
you know, in my, in my work life, I, I'm never really done. So that's a, that can be a, a life challenge, but, but on balance, mm-hmm. it, it's a good thing. And listen, there's nothing you can do to stop it. So you can complain and whine and say it's stupid and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, it's here, it's going to continue to change. And if you want to be part of the, of the big world, you, you got to find your place in it. Are you adjusting okay though? Like you, you think it's, you know, with age, you're just getting more and more stressed because you're like, oh man, <laughs> new things every day, every day. What do I do with myself? I mean, listen, I, I have a sweet life. Let's be honest. Okay. I mean, this is yeah. not that hard. Really. Um, you know, I get to hang out with people and meet interesting folks and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, sit around and talk and tell stories. And, I, you know, it beats real work. Let's, let, let, let's be honest. Nobody, nobody wants to hear me complain about it. That's for sure. Um, it has required stuff in me that mm-hmm. I didn't realize was there or that, that, that I wasn't naturally inclined to. I mean, this whole entrepreneurial piece of it, right? I, I grew up, as I said, in the newspaper business, and it was my job to write the column. I, you know, I wrote three of them a week for, I don't know, 20-something years. And it was somebody else's job to sell the paper and promote the mm-hmm. paper and get the ads and you know, I didn't, I didn't have to think about any of that. All yeah. I had to do was write my columns and I mean, they had to be good or I was going to get fired. But, um, today I'm constantly thinking about technology and thinking about how do I reach the audience and, and how do I give them something that they consider valuable and would, would make them want to come back to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and also as that technology continues to change and, and it's not stopping, it's going to keep changing, believe me. Um, I have had to, in various ways, reinvent what it is that I do. Um, you know, ink on paper thrown on your doorstep at six in the morning and billed by the month is not the way people communicate anymore. Yeah. And so if I want to be relevant as a, as a writer or a talker or a storyteller, or, or if I want to be able to make a living at this, I've got to find my place in all those new worlds. And that that journey, trying to figure that stuff out and, and learn to learn to operate in, in these constantly changing worlds, yeah, it's a it's a daily challenge. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that I've I've been able to do it and, and have some mm-hmm. success at it. And I'm also frustrated sometimes by it because it's tough. Oh yeah. So it's it's safe to say it's helped you grow, right? Kind of overcome oh, yeah. a few things. Yeah, and I did it because I had to. Let me be honest. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't wake up in the morning and say, "Gee, I'd love to change my career completely." I mean, was it nicer? What? what how? How was since? Since I can't relate to that. Like, how? How was it just being able to write the paper and then shutting off for the next the whole weekend? Right? You don't well, have to hear it from anybody until Monday, essentially. Yeah. Um, Kinda. Well, you know, it's funny. I was even in those days. I was a guy who liked doing new stuff. So when I was writing newspaper columns, I started doing the Talking Head TV thing, right? This was coming up. These cable yeah. channels were coming around, and they needed people, and I liked doing it. And I, I got, what, ego gratification and money and all the, all the other stuff you want, attention, all the other stuff you want. Um, and so and I did talk radio and, and, and did, did, did other stuff. So I, I was always sort of open to, to You're doing ready. new to do a new things. Yeah. Um, the part of it that was hard for me was thinking more entrepreneurially, if I'm saying that word correctly. Um, I, have, I have the same problem. <laughs> you know, thinking of myself as like a brand and a business and, uh, you know, I got to figure out uh, how to how to play that in the world. I, I just wasn't, I didn't grow up like that. I didn't come from a family where people thought about that kind of stuff. And so I had to learn to do that if I was going to continue to, to stay relevant in the world. And it's interesting. Some of it I really like. Like, like I enjoy dreaming up the ideas. I, I, like, I like pitching. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. mind sitting down in the room and saying, okay, I've got this great idea. Here's what I think we should do. And, and it turns out I'm pretty good at that. There are a couple of parts of it I'm not good at. I suck at asking for money. Um, mm-hmm. I, in fact, luckily I have, I have some agents who, who, who can help me with that, but you know, I'm the guy who says, may I please do it for less? turns out that's not a very good, very good business strategy. Um, so, you know, I, I have had the, the money part of yeah. it, asking for money, asking people for money. Um, you know, those of you guys who are, you know, who are in the sales world, it comes naturally or, or at least oh, yeah. you're used to it. 
Um, but but I've had to I've had to learn that, and I've had to find allies who can help me with. It. Yeah, because they say you know entrepreneurialism that the you know that it is a very dark deep hole you kind of dive yourself into. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it could it's some some say it's pretty narcissistic too because you're you're selling yourself constantly. You know, so that's sure. something that's something we're doing all of us all the time. Uh, how, how do you feel about that? Like, do you do you feel it's you've taken a hit with it a little bit? Well, you know, it's, that's a great question. Uh, let me let me back up a second. Yeah. When I was growing up, and I come from a you know big Catholic Southern, grew up in New Orleans family, you know, loud storytellers, talkers, sitting around the kitchen table arguing about stuff. That, that that's the that's the world I come out of. And we would talk about religion. Sometimes we'd even talk about sex. We would never talk about money. I mean, I, I don't know what how much money my father made. I, we always, I kind of grew up with the notion that you know, there was something kind of tacky or low class when people talked about money. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. Did you talk you know, politics? I, I'm sorry? Did you talk politics? Oh, all the time. Oh, okay. oh, it was always, okay. we talked, we debated. And it's, it's funny what I do now for a living is kind of what I was doing when I was eight years old, eight years old at dinner. Okay. Uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't realize <laughs> that was ironic. career training, but it, it turned out that was career training. Uh, but, but the parts of it, yeah, it, it's a great question. I have had to make myself do that because, mm-hmm. you know, listen, I work in the media world in New York and, and, and other places, and there are not a lot of shy people around here. I, I mean, you know, you just, you just have to learn to, you have to learn to do it your way. I guess that's what I, I guess that's the real lesson I've learned. It's that it's not that you have to be a pushy jerk. In fact, that's not something that would work for me because it's just, it's not who I am. Um, but it turns out that's not the only way you can deal with this sort of stuff. You know, you can deal with it in, in a way that's more comfortable for me, which mm-hmm. is to be more, I don't know, try to be a little more charming about it or funnier or find a way to bond with people that isn't just, you know, being this aggressive New Yorker, because that's just, that's not going to work for me. I mean, it works for other people. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I don't discount its value, but it's, it's not me and it's, it wouldn't work for me. I don't think. Cause I mean, that's part of your brand too, right? You're not, you're not really here as much talking about yourself. You really promote others right? The storytelling aspect of it. Like that's a whole other part. Yeah. It's interesting. Some of it is about me and some of it is. So, so let me, let me separate like this. So in my time, and I still do some of this, um, as a newspaper columnist or as a, as a TV performer or even, or even doing live talks, which I, which, which thankfully I get to, I get to do some of it's standing in front of an audience and, you know, being the luncheon speaker or the mm-hmm. keynote or whatever it is. That is kind of about me. I mean, yeah, it those, is, they you have know, to be, right? <laughs> yeah, it's me giving my point of view about stuff. You know, whether whether I'm talking about, you know, what's going on with Donald Trump or what's happening in the media or some other some other topic, um, that is pretty much about me. The, the books that I've done are different. Um, all of those are not really so much about me. Mm-hmm. They're me paired with somebody else or somebody who has achieved something amazing in life. Oh yeah. Um, has had some extraordinary show. It could be a politician, a military guy, a sports hero, uh, or just some regular person who has found him or herself in some amazing situation that that there could be a successful book about it. And so what I've been doing a lot of in the last few years is pairing up with those people and making these books. And so, you know, we each bring something. It's like any good partnership. We each yeah. bring something unique. So so they bring whatever the amazing stuff is they've done and their willingness to sit down with me and share it with me and let me poke into it. Mm-hmm. And I bring my storytelling chops. So how do I write it? How do I tell it in a way that that a reader is going to be interested in it? And, and, and this is the most important part of all, I suppose, is how do we do it in a way that it's going to sell a lot of copies? You know, publishers, you know, want to make books that people want to read. I don't want to, I don't want to write worst selling books. You know, I want to write books yeah. that, that millions of people read. And so, so crafting that, making that happen, figuring out, you know, this is the right project and this other one isn't the right project. 
um, and then telling it in a way that people can can feel something, can get some, can feel like the twenty bucks they spent on that hardcover book yeah. were were worth it. You know, that's that's what I do, and that isn't so much about me. It's not Ellis, Ellis, Ellis. It's me using my storytelling talent, I guess, to uh, to tell a great story. So is it kind of almost like giving back a little bit? So it's not all always about you. Um, gosh, that makes it sound better than it is. It makes me <laughs> sound like like I have very high, you know, high ethical morals. Here. Like you just like yeah. you just adopted a child from a different I, country. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'll take it. I don't mind the description, but I mean, I'm yeah. being paid for it. Let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. You know, I'm not doing them for free. Um, I mean, you know, some of the books so, you've written, like How to Catch a Russian Spy, The Uninvited, Let Me Finish, Tuesday's uh-huh. Promise, Make, Making It in America. I mean, that's just to name a few. Uh, which one's been, what, the, what was the most difficult one uh, to write? Um, honestly, I wouldn't say any of them have been dramatically more difficult than the others. Here's how, let me unpack that for you. So writing a book is hard. I mean, it's, you know, you got to write 300 pages or something like that, sitting at a blank computer screen, no matter how experienced you are, it still takes a lot of concentration and a lot of energy. And, you know, it's, I mean, it's hard. It's a lot harder than writing a 700 word newspaper column or, or sitting down on a, on a, you know, video screen and yakking with you for, for 45 minutes or an hour. I mean, this is, this is fun, right? This yeah. isn't, I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm hating every second of this. This is cool. Um, but I hope not. <laughs> no, I mean, but writing is hard. I mean, and I'm a, you know, I've, I've been a writer for a long time. It's still hard. Um, so what, what differentiates the different books, and, you know, some of the people I've worked with, they're all, listen, they're all people with big egos who achieve great things. I mean, I, I've written, you know, a book with Chris Christie, the governor, former governor of New Jersey, mm-hmm. with the head of training for the Navy SEALs, with an NFL coach and a, and a NASCAR driver and, you know, a baseball pitcher, and you know, a lot of famous, big, major people. And they're right. all, you know, police commissioner in New York. Um, managing them is part of my job. You know, I've got to get them see that. to, you know, and to, to pay attention, to give it the time that it needs, to ship, and, and to, to give me the good stuff, honestly. Yeah. When we start out, a lot of them have some idea of what they think their story is, but they're usually wrong. They usually don't really know what their story is. And so mm-hmm. I've got to guide them down the road that helps them tell the story as well as it can possibly be told. So, so lately I've been working with the guy who's the governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan. And he's got an amazing story. I mean, he's, mm-hmm. a, he's a Republican governor in an overwhelmingly Democratic state, like three to one Democratic in Maryland. And yet he's the most popular governor in America. He has like an 80% approval rate, which is just, just off the charts. I mean, nobody today in politics has an approval rate. Like that. Mm-hmm. No. Um, and he's got an amazing story. I mean, he'd never been elected to office before. He was a business guy. He came out of the real estate development business. Um, three months after he was elected, he had riots in Baltimore, his biggest city. Horrible, terrible riots. He really came in and was the mm-hmm. hero of. And then two months after that, still in his first year as governor, he got late stage lymphoma. So, you know, life threatening, horrible cancer. And he was extremely open about it with the people in the state. They went through chemo with him and he lost his hair. And the, the Pope came and prayed on him. And Tim McGraw came and sang to him. And the people were all wearing these, these Hogan Strong bracelets of uh-huh. for him. Huh. And so it's so, you know, this guy's got an amazing story. Yeah. And, and, and you got, you got me in. You got me in. Yeah. And he's the governor. So he's got all the, you know, the political stories and the underdog running for office. And the book is going to come out uh, in June. It's called Still Standing, mm-hmm. which I think is a pretty good title. Yeah. And, but, you know, so we spent the last months trying to figure out, you know, how do we tell him? You know, he's, uh, you know, he, he's actually was not hard to get to be open. I mean, he's a pretty open guy. But, but I've had others who were, you know, much more reluctant to share things. And I had to convince them, hey, Unless you're really open and honest here, this book is going to suck. You yeah. know, people want the real, you got to be open and, and reveal stuff. You can't just put out a bunch of press releases. That's a, that's a boring book. So that's the, that's the challenge for me. And thankfully, I think I've been able to convince all of them, really, um, that, that telling an honest book, including admitting your mistakes, 
and talking about the things you screwed up and, you know, how you've learned things now that you didn't know before. That's what's interesting about people. Yeah. And so that's what I try to get in the books. How does the process usually work? Like, do you meet up a lot and do like one-on-one -on -one interviews? Do you just yeah. go back and forth with calls? Like call, you know, it's funny. I, I find it better to do in person. Certainly, Same. certainly the main interviewing, I, I would much rather do in person. Um, sometimes the follow-up, you know, I can call them up and check a fact or something like that. But usually I, I'll go to where they are or sometimes they come over to my, to, to, to my apartment in New York mm -hmm. and it depends on where they are. Um, like I just, I did a book, uh, that's just coming out now with, um, there was a story last summer, I don't know if you remembered, but, a, but a bunch of kids in Thailand got stuck in a cave, a soccer mm -hmm. team. In Thailand. Oh yeah. And so I did a book with the kids and with the two doctors who were the cave oh, wow. diving doctors who saved them. Now the kids are in Thailand. Uh -huh. <laughs> the doctors are in Australia. Um, huh. So I went. To, I mean, I had to go to those places. I had to. It was fun. I, I love going to those places. Oh, that's, that's but, a great idea. You know, and, you know, we we call back and forth and all, but but it works much better if you're sitting there talking. How long did you have to do, like go to each a location for to get enough content? I mean, I made a, I made a couple of different a couple of different trips of a, of a couple of weeks each. Um, so you know, we just sit down and and, and just like this. I mean, we just sit down and talk. I run tape, um, and then I get the tape transcribed, and that, that's sort of the process. I, I don't mm -hmm. ask the people to write a word. Um, I we just talk. I kind of you know lead them through the story step by step, and then I take that tape. Once it's once it's typed up, mm -hmm. and then you know work with that material and begin forming that into chapters, and then I, I, I show them the chapters, and we you know we clean it up and correct the mistakes and try to get it right. And oftentimes they'll read one story and then they'll say, "Oh yeah, that's good," but this reminds me of some other thing that's even yeah, better. New so, stuff, right? Yeah, that's the that, that's the process. Awesome, and uh, kind of like backtracking now, you mentioned you know being being on all these different uh, news channels. Uh, and cable news channels, right? Specifically, mm -hmm. uh, you you brought up an interesting point, and I kind of we just got carried away because there's so much good content. But uh, sometimes you got steered into kind of what you had to say and what you couldn't. No, no, or, I was no? Saying, I was saying I really did. I I think the listen. Each of these networks today has yeah. a has a pretty clear, you know, tone, approach, political outlook. I guess it's fair to say. Um, you know, the world is, it's, that's how the world is divided, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's different for me when I'm on CNN versus when I'm on Fox. You know, I mean, they're just, I'm going to be asked different kind of questions and the issues are going to be presented differently. But thankfully, nobody has ever really tried to say, to tell me what to say. Like they will present, you know, they'll challenge me in different ways. On the, you know? when it's live, right? Like not yeah. You don't you don't know about it as much pre beforehand, do you? Yeah, sometimes I know the general topic. I mean, listen, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that today there's only one topic. It's Donald Trump. Yes, somehow or another, right? Oh, so yeah. there's no other issue really in, in, in cable news. Um, you know, now it might be the Democrats who are you know running in the Iowa caucuses and what is that? But in the end, it all yeah. comes back to Trump. What do you think about that whole thing that just happened last night? Recording that today. Was a mess. It's a mess. I mean, recording today know. on uh, February fourth. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, listen. It was a I, Iowa blew it. Uh, they couldn't. You know, it took you know a day before people really knew who won, uh, and they'll never be fully satisfied. So, um, how do they solve this? Is there any way right now? Um, I mean, listen. I, can Iowa figure out how to count the votes? Probably. I mean, they'll try some different system next time. Yeah. If if they get to be the first. Uh, vote voters next time. There may be some some questioning about it. I mean, we, listen, we've got a very weird way of picking president. Let's be honest. Here. Yeah. I mean, why do we why do we start in Iowa? I mean, that's it, a state that it's a lovely place, but it's not a state that's particularly representative of America. Um, you know, it's much more rural. It's much whiter. It's much older. It's uh, you know, it's, it it isn't really reflective of of, of who our country is. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, do you yeah, make I mean, do you make anything of it? Well, you, I mean, you got to, you can't ignore it. I mean, it is uh, the first time people get to vote and it, the candidates, they all know the rules. So, you know, you know my attitude about it is I want to see who's strongest. Um, and you're not going to know that. I mean, polls don't really tell you that and debates don't really tell you that. Voters don't. And so let's go have a bunch of votes. 
I mean, that's that, that's how you find out who's yeah. who's the strongest candidate. See who see who keeps winning. <laughs> that's a, that's a pretty good way to to know. Isn't <laughs> That'll it? work, yeah. <laughs> um, but and then a couple other major you know topics out there. How do you how do you feel about the coronavirus? Um, gosh, I, I don't want to get it. Um, yeah, it it brings up. I mean, listen, this whole public health reality mm-hmm. in a global world. Is a it's a fascinating and complicated and, and really important topic. Um, of, of course, diseases don't respect boundaries, and in a world where people fly around all over the place and it's cheap and easy and, and, and routine, nothing stays in one place forever. And so, what do we do about it? I mean, to to me, the the interesting underlying issue here is we are having a big debate in our country about science. Right? Whether we should believe and trust science, and I'm I'm pretty pro science. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think the developments that we've gotten from researchers in the medical world and biological world and other places, pharmacy, uh, have made lives way better. And so, when all the top scientists in the world tell me that the planet is getting hotter, and if we don't do something about it, we're going to have problems, I tend to listen to that. Mm-hmm. And you know, I come from Louisiana. And when people explain to me that um, because of coastal erosion, the wetlands are disappearing, and that makes the hurricanes a lot worse in places like my beloved hometown of New Orleans, um, I want to listen to that, and I want to yeah. start thinking about, okay, so what are we going to do about it? And I think we have a parallel thing going on right now in the world of public health. So, you know, these viruses are real. Um, they are killing people. And we got to find ways to contain them. And I don't really think politicians are the best people to decide that. I, I'd frankly rather have the doctors decide that than have the politicians decide. And do you do you believe any of the conspiracy behind it? Like saying that you know uh, the the media focusing more on the flu itself here in America, and then you know how this might have leaked on purpose, or like you know all the different types of uh, stories we're hearing out there. You have any, any I mean, take on that? I, I'm a little skeptical about it. You know, I mean, bad pe- people do bad things from time to time. And so I don't want to, I don't want to pretend that certainly not the media perfect in all instances. I mean, we, we make mistakes and uh, do things usually though. And this is just from my years of working in the media, being in the middle of, of, of that world. It's not organized conspiracies that explain the problems. I mean, mm-hmm. there's no meeting. There's no facts that goes around that tells all the people in the media what they're supposed to Only say. Only this today. That's it. That's it awesome. doesn't. I mean, I promise you, folks, even those of you who, who want to believe that, that's not, that's not what happens. Uh-huh. There are some things. I mean, you know, we're ignorant. We learn things like everybody does over time. Um, people make mistakes. Now, you know, in my side of the street, the media, I think you should acknowledge that. And you should correct it. And when you make a mistake, you should say I was wrong and I'm going to make it better. Um, But listen, I'm a big believer in truth. And I think there is stuff that's true. I mean, I I understand today it's sometimes hard to find. But I believe in facts. And I believe that we ought to try and search for them. And that's how we learn and get better. This idea of... You know, this is big conspiracy, and you can't believe anything. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. Uh, how do you? Uh, sorry, uh, I don't see your screen. Uh oh, let's see. Oh, good. and kind of going off, and kind of going more further off that. Um, how did you feel about? You know, now kind of just since we're on the media topic, how do you feel the, about the crumble of legacy media? Do you think that's we've a lost thing? something? Yeah, we've lost something. It, it, it's real. Um, you know, the newspaper business, which which I come out of, is a shadow of its former self. I, I mean, this the money and the resources that uh, paid for a lot of great work isn't there anymore. Um, and we've lost something, and we, and we haven't fully replaced it yet. Uh, there's great promise, of course, in all this uh, digital media, yeah. and social media, and, but I, there's some things that doesn't do well. It's, it's really good about allowing regular folks to be heard. That's, that's valuable. But it's also true that we need, you know, great investigative reporters digging out things about government. And we need uh, uh, a Baghdad bureau telling us what's happening in Iraq 
and you know, th- multiply that by a thousand. And the social media world hasn't figured out how to provide that for us yet. And so it is worrisome. I mean, it's particularly worrisome in local communities across mm-hmm. America where there aren't people covering city hall and the school board and the state legislature and all the stuff that really affects so many people's lives because the newspapers and to some extent local TV that used to provide that doesn't have the resources to do it anymore. So, so, you know, there aren't 20 local reporters covering local government in in some middle sized city. There's two and we're losing from that. And that's a bad thing. Um, Why do you think that is? Is just, is it overall just everybody's focused on bigger picture, bigger picture constantly. So we go to the bigger sources. I, I, I think it goes to technology. I mean, the audience left, you know, people aren't buying the paper and advertisers aren't advertising. And so, You know, I I mean, I don't blame the publisher or the editor so much um, because the business model isn't there. Um, You know, you you can see it happen. I mean, Craigslist essentially stole the classified advertising business from newspapers. That's hugely lucrative. We made tons of money on classified ads. You know, anytime you wanted to sell a car or buy a house or or, or hire an employee, people used to put a little, you know, two or three line ad in the paper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we at the newspaper, you know, we charged them a buck a word or something for it. And, you know, you put a lot of words on one of those pages. And so that business is gone. And so those those classified ads used to pay for three city hall reports. Yeah. And they're gone. And the readers are. So, I mean, we just I just think we're not smart enough. We need smart people and young people and techie people to help us sort that out. And I don't I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, because. Essentially, what you're saying is these local, uh, these local papers need to find a way to get with the times. Yeah, and listen, they've all tried. You know, they all have websites now, yeah. right? I mean, they've all, but not as many people know about them or go on them. And it's that's true, and it's yeah. also harder to make money there for some reason. And I'm maybe you know your 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 listeners and viewers will understand this better than I do. But for some reason, people are willing to pay fifty cents for a newspaper. But they don't want to pay five dollars a month for access to a website, and I don't think the ads work as well. I think the local car dealer who put that ad in the newspaper found that was more successful than putting a banner ad on a website. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I, it's that's you, you've, you've just gone past my, you know, my yeah. my intelligence on that. I it, I'll tell you, it's really important that we figure it out. And I'm I'm racking my brain, but boy, I think I need help on that. One. Yeah, because I mean, if you think about it, all these sources are free, right? Why pay a few bucks when you could log on to Twitter and get a link in the back end or someone will post about it anyway? And it's free, 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 right? That's true. Now it's it may not be out. as good. It may not be as reliable. It may not be as true. You know, it may be put through some crazy conspiracy filter or something. <laughs> Um, you know, when you read something there, can yeah. you really believe it? I don't know. I mean, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post and Newsday, the paper that I worked at, none of them are perfect. But I'll tell you this, they had a pretty rigorous editorial process. And there were fact checkers and copy editors and some really smart people writing those stories. Mm-hmm. And again, conceding that it's not perfect, boy, it's a whole lot more reliable than what you're reading on your uh, on your Facebook page. I promise you that. What's your prediction with all this, like five, 10 years? Do you think more and more crumble and things become even more centralized? I'm an optimist. I mean, I think we're going to figure it out. I mean, I think people will figure out how to make money and pay for great reporting and, and you know, get more comfortable with the business models. And I, I mean, I, I think, I hope. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it's important. And people are trying different things. I mean, in some cities... You know, some rich guy has bought the paper and it's just subsidizing it. And uh, in other places, you know, people are subscribing online and, and paying for it that way. I do know this much that in the end, things like great reporting, you got to pay for it. Somebody's got to yeah. pay for it. Um, because it's, I mean, listen, I know I'm a writer. Writing's hard. I don't, I'm not going to do it for free. I'll talk for free, but I don't want to write for free. You think it's possible that? Uh, kind of like how, you know, how things are coming back, you know, the, the 70s styles, the 80s styles, it's like, you know, all in trends, you know, Interesting. is Interesting. it possible that things start making their way back? 
Because, you know, it's like, flip it's phones like are coming back, you know, the yeah, vinyl. vinyl records, right? Yeah. You know, um, like, is it possible that we just get yeah. sick of all the fake news out there and that we want to get to the, the source and maybe like, you know, we backtrack? Maybe that it's, was better. It's, it's, I mean, I like the optimism that's wrapped up in that. Um, I don't know. I think there is a listen, listen, it has never been more important than it is right this minute for all of us to know in a, in a reliable and smart way what's going on in the world around us. We've never needed to know that more than we do today. It's super mm-hmm. important and to our careers and our lives and our intellectual journeys and our psychological health. We need to know what's happening. Um, and so I think that creates a market for people who are able to provide good versions of that. But I don't know. I don't think print newspapers are coming back. I mean, maybe a few people will like them in the same way that a few people like vinyl records. But yeah. the record business isn't anything like it was. I mean, artists don't make a lot of money on record sales anymore. You know, the only way they make money is on touring and, and Concerts, caps yeah. and T-shirts, you know. Um, so I don't I'm not a nostalgist. I don't think, oh, we're all going to go back to riding horses and buggies around. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's going to happen either. Yeah, and and especially now with uh, like for example, you know, officers and a lot of people out there wearing cameras at every step of the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's that's true. I don't. Yeah, that that idea of like our lost privacy and I mean yeah. those are all legitimate concerns. But I, I mean, I don't think you can live off the grid, or mm-hmm. if you do, it's you know you're gonna miss a lot of stuff. Um, so you know, we do our best. I mean, we keep the secrets we try to keep, and we understand that. You know, there's a lot of things that we can't keep private anymore. I mean, somebody can go find my credit rating, I'm sure, or uh, no you know, problem. Can look yeah. can stalk me online, and you know, I've had to deal with some of that. But uh, it's just, I, you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't think you can change. I don't think you just have to figure out how to harness it. You think we're we're going in the right step with privacy? As no, we're saying. no. But I mean, no. there's money to be made knowing you know, what I might buy. I mean, there's companies who figured out how to make money. If, if I'm online and searching with Google, you know, airline flights to, to Wichita, um, that's a valuable fact. Yeah. And some hotel operator in Wichita is going to want to know that I'm the guy who's getting ready to come to Wichita um, because they'll send me a bunch of promotions for hotels in Wichita. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's the technology drives it. Like to me, that's what the mistake we make is looking for other scapegoats, right? There's some yeah. people want to blame immigrants. Oh my God, my career is going to hell because these Mexican that's guys me. are coming. That's not. <laughs> that's not it. I mean, it's not a. It's not an immigrant that's taking your job. It's a robot. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, but I don't. I mean, again, I, I don't think it's going back. Where I don't think you can stop it. I just think we have to figure out as smart people how we're going to take the good of it and beat back the bad and, uh, and, and make it work for us. It's a, it's a scary thing, right? I mean, between the privacy issue, the robots, right? Taking over a lot of jobs. It, it almost, if you look at it, if you're slightly pessimistic, like you look at it and you're like, wow, we are doomed. Like count down yeah. the days, you know, global warming on top of that. Like yeah. how, how, do, how does one, uh, how does one keep a positive mindset know. in this know. day and age? Self delusion. How do you, how do you get up every day? What, what do you yeah, do? What's what's your routine? <laughs> my God, you're making me feel so bleak here. Um, I, I don't. I mean, gosh, why? You know, yes, all those things are real. Um, but we also have a lot of great stuff. I mean, we have all these uh, opportunities and mm-hmm. the technologies provide us. All. I mean, you and I couldn't have done this ten years yeah, ago. That is true. Um, and this is valuable. I, you know, this is a great way to to, to communicate and share ideas and to bring others into the, into the thought process. And I, you know, so listen, I, I don't know. A lot of this is just temperamental. I'm, I'm basically a fairly cheerful person. and I trust my ability to bob and weave through it. Yeah, and, uh, I don't know. I mean, I hope I'm able to listen. That said, there are people who are suffering and let's, let's recognize it. If you were a, you know, factory worker in the Midwest, 55 years old and your plant is closing, um, I mean, you are kind of screwed. You know, the next job you're going to get is probably not going to be as good. Mopping up and, something or yeah, handing something out, right? You know, I mean, and somewhere in the service world, or if, if you're lucky enough to get that. Um, and, 
you know, healthcare is expensive and, and sending your kids to college is expensive and real estate in, in some places is expensive. Um, and those people aren't wrong when they say, I feel like my opportunities are diminishing. And it's natural that they would look for someone to blame mm -hmm. or that they would believe false hopes. You know, oh, we're going to open the coal mine again. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure we're going to yeah. open the coal mine again. Yeah, that's, that's a tough um, and, and so, so I, like many people, we look for answers. So how can you retrain those people? And some of them, you give them new skills. And maybe that guy can go, you know, install solar panels. You know, is he going to be retrained as a computer coder? Maybe. Uh, but maybe not. Yeah. Uh, it's a, obviously depends person to person. Um, but that's those to me, that, that conversation really important. And it's going to affect our future a lot. It's uh, and have your have your views about all these things kind of changed over time? Like, how do you form your your views? You know, that's 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 interesting. I don't know that my views have changed. I think what's happened is that the the issues have gone from philosophical or political issues mm -hmm. to real life. You know, it's not these are not theoretical debates for most of us. This is, this is my life and your life and, and, and the life of everyone who's listening to us. You know, how am I going to make it through these changing worlds? And I, like I say, I think you got to. I don't think you're going to stop it. I think it's up to all of us to figure those, those things out. But, man, that's real. You know, I, five years from now, you and I are going to be communicating in some other way. And both of us need to learn it. Let's just, yeah. let's just say that right now. We, both, we don't know what it's going to be. We don't know when it's coming. But I promise you, it's going to be something, and I promise you, it's coming. And if we want to be relevant in the world, we we better figure out how to operate with it. I'm going to be sitting here in my house. You're going to be at yours, but I'm actually going to be there. Like my person's going to be there, and I'll be communicating with you. Probably, him. yeah. We'll come sit on the couch. You know, it'll be. I don't know. Somehow we'll figure. That'll it out. be awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's kind of safe to say that maybe we're we're kind of opening. Uh, we're we're living more in the times like we're not all z as much maybe zombies, right? We're more kind of being opened to life yeah. a little bit. Yeah, with that's, whole... that's, that, that's true. That's true. Uh, I mean, listen, it's, it's, it's threats and opportunities. Yeah. And so, you know, those things can be pretty scary um, because we don't always know the answers. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's fun. Sometimes you find them in weird places. I mean, I mean, I'll give you one example. As the, in, in my own career, as the newspaper business began to decline, it became clear to me that hey, this is I, I got it. This isn't going to keep me going for the next thirty years or whatever it is I needed. Um, so I was grateful that I had begun working in television and that I had established a, a presence in the digital world. What I didn't expect was that books would become a big part of my life. Now, books are in some ways the most old, the oldest and most, you know, untechy form of communication imaginable. But but there was still a great book business. A lot of people still read books. Yeah, and whether so they read them, you know, whether they read them online uh -huh. or they read them on a Kindle or they or they read them on ink on paper, uh, uh, who cares? Uh, but there were a lot of people still like reading books. And I mean, I think I understand why. Books are really a great way to dive into something, dive into a world or to learn something or to, or to have yourself, you know, stretch your mind in some way. And, and there's also a book business. You know, they're publishing companies and they pay money for stuff and they know how to market it and get it in the hands of readers. And so unexpectedly, that turned out to be a great opportunity for me. It, my the, some core skills that I had, yeah, you know, interviewing and writing and storytelling, were valued in that world. It, even though I, I didn't really had I never really thought about it much, and that's produced a big part of my of my career in the in the past decade. And so, you know, I, I guess the lesson in that is that you can find the answers sometimes in unexpected places. Um, and you just need to be open and you need to be willing mm -hmm. to willing to try stuff. And even if it's not all going to work. That's uh that's nicely put. I was uh, going to ask what's your recommendation for us to do. And it's kind of sounds like stick with it, right? Stick that's with your skill set. That's all I got. That's all I got, man. I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know where this stuff is heading. I, I don't think any of this. Um, but I do know the change will continue. 
I do know that it will put pressure on all of us. You know, the idea we do one thing for 50 years, that's over. That's not, none of our lives are going to be like that. Um, and if we're going to stay relevant, we're going to continue to succeed and we're going to be able to entertain ourselves and make the world a better place. You know, all the things we want from our, from our lives. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> you gotta, yeah, you gotta be open and energetic and, and willing to, willing to be surprised. All right. Well, now, Ellis Hennigan, everybody, by the way, uh, one more time, be sure to check out Hennigan.com. That's H-E-N-I-C-A-N.com. And now we're on to our listeners' favorite segment of the show. Welcome to the round with no name because they're all taken. Miko is back. This is uh, Miro's evil twin, Miko. He's taking over this round. So uh, currently... You, uh, you have a new set of rules you have to follow during this part of the interview. You will have five seconds to initiate an answer to every question. We just want to know a little, we want to know a little bit more about you, Ellis. And, um, we just don't want you thinking about it too much. Just giving okay. us a quick, quick answers. Um, five seconds. And here we go. Right. What is your favorite book? Not one of your own. Oh God, that's so hard. Um, the execution of the song by uh, by Mela because it's a great piece of reporting and it's beautifully written. That's a boss to boss exclusive first time. Your what is your favorite movie? Um, hmm, God, five seconds. That's so so hard. I go back to my To Kill a Mockingbird. Just throw it out there. Yeah, that's a classic. That's a as someone uh, that's been mentioned actually like once or twice. Yeah, yeah. it's those of us from the south are influenced by it. I think. If you're stranded on an island, just in case you might be later on, I'm preparing you now. What is the one item you want with you? It can't be a person. Oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be my iPhone. Do I have cell service? I mean, it does everything. That's rough. Right? It does everything. <laughs> and you're gonna need like a brick of a battery that's gonna last you forever. If I handed you a thousand dollars to go buy yourself something nice right now after this podcast, what would you go out there and buy? Here's what I spent so much money on eating. Really, that's the one thing I like, I like to go out to great restaurants. So I'd, I'd have I'd have three great meals in New York, which is about <laughs> all it would pay for. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fact. I was just there. <laughs> that's, about, that's about what it would cover. Maybe two or three. It depends on where we went. Better not I don't be taking. I don't yeah. care about like I don't have a car. I don't care about great clothes. I don't. I, I love going out to great restaurants. So. I was just that, uh, oh, speaking of which, what is your favorite restaurant, your number one pick right now in New York? You know, the place I love, it's funny because we always go to places in our neighborhood. I live in Troy Pack in Lower Manhattan. There's a place, there's a couple blocks from my house called Tamarind. It is an Indian restaurant. I didn't really think of like high-end Indian food, but it is so great. My wife and I go, we sit at the bar there. The food is absolutely amazing. The people are nice and um it's great. Tamarind on Hudson Street in New York. Oh, I'm going to write that, write that one down. Last time I checked out Peter Luger's. That yeah, was, that's a big meal, man. You're still getting over that. That was life-changing. Oh, <laughs> Literally. Don't, you can't do that every week. No. like uh, I'm not a big meat eater either. My yeah, fiance big, as well. We, we were yeah. done, but like, wow. Wow. Um, and uh, last um, couple more. Who is or has been your greatest mentor? Um, people you've never heard of, um, great editors, uh, you know, Don Lee Keith is a writer in New Orleans, uh, John Cotter, who's one of my editors at Newsday, Don Forrest, another editor at Newsday. Those are the people I, I learned to do this from. All of them taught me the same thing. Tell stories people want to hear. If what is the way that you drink your coffee? Every day, constantly, I'm a, it's my last addiction. I'm not addicted to anything, but I am addicted to coffee. How do you I drink, drink it, it though? With, with, with whole milk. Whole milk? Whole milk. No sugar, whole milk. Oh. And, yeah. and strong. And you, strong. You're pro-dairy, huh? There's so many anti-dairy people um, out there. I'm a, I'm a pro how dairy. much is? I mean, come on. It's like an ounce. <laughs> it's not that unless I don't know. It's like I don't as far as I know, I'm I'm very lactate tolerant. Which lactose. Inter- That's what which they call it. Lactose, right? lactose. Lactose, lactate. I yeah. I don't even there's 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 something for everything now. I got no jo- problem. With join that. the club. I'm good with, I'm good with that. <laughs> but don't offend anyone because everybody will get offended. <laughs> um so if uh for all the interviews that you've been on or you are interviewing someone what is the one that you just you are so nervous for 
Um, gosh, it's funny. I I probably should be more nervous than I am. I just here's here's what people uh, here's how I'd answer that. When I used to do O'Reilly a lot, but while he still had a TV show, mm-hmm. uh, my liberal friends would always say, "How can you stand that guy? He's such a jerk." I'm like, "You should meet some of my relatives. You know, they're like my he's like my uncles. Except in my family, they're all drinking when we're having those conversations. So they're much tougher than any whoever the most aggressive, scariest interviewer are." I am prepared from childhood part. Bring it on, I say. And last but not least, if I uh, came over there by your office and I was like, Ellis, I got a million dollar idea for you. Let's sit down and talk. And I walked in with socks and sandals. How would you feel about me? And you know, I'm very, <laughs> very non-judgmental. I deal with a lot of strange people. Uh, you would have to do something a lot more than socks and sandals to get me to throw you, you and your million-dollar idea out the door. I will, I will take it from the devil himself. I respect that. <laughs> and all right, the evil twin Miko is gone. The original huh. Mir- Miro is back. You have Sweet. survived, Ellis. You have survived. I uh, did my best. Got to know a little bit more about you. We appreciate that. And um, we just want to we just want to thank you here for, uh, for yeah, being on fun. the show, being on Bossed to Boss podcast. Ellis Hulligan, everybody. has Hennigan.com. I think I butchered it once. Ellis Hennigan. Hennigan.com. And uh, yeah, if, if you have any closing thoughts for us, you know, definitely been a pleasure. Uh, the, the mic is yours. If there's anything else you would, you yeah, no, to listen, it's, I, it, this is great, and, and you're, I love what you're doing. I mean, you're pursuing ideas, you're diving into stuff that really does affect people's real lives today. These are big issues in a way, but every single one of them affects you know, how it is that we're going to be able to to have our careers, and live productive lives, and be successful. I mean, if you can tie those big picture items into people's lives, your your show will just do great people will want to watch it and they'll learn something from it and they'll come back again next time nice to be with you <laughs> yes it's been a pleasure i really look forward to more uh in the future and and, and i'm excited thanks so sure. much and, and and for everybody listening that was a real new york um ambulance probably right driving back. <laughs> that was live that was live That's, no editing that was there. Live. and they're coming <laughs> for me i'm sure i don't know <laughs> take care alice see you brother That is all for this episode of Bossed to Boss. Your next step is to visit bossedtoboss.com where you will find proven techniques followed by professionals to help you make that next step. Again, that is Bossed, the number two boss.com. And remember, the time is now.